Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to give the talk. Um, and did the model of a while since Estraba Moxenabas. So uh, the the topic actually goes back to my studies uh, at uh, at Tbilisi State University, my master's studies under uh, Professor Hadrina Saridze and uh, also a bit of my PhD. So what I will present now is, is a little update on that. Um, uh, the, the, the talk is divided in, in, in a few sections and um, I'm going to uh, go through each of them. Uh, the notes that you see here are actually on my um, website and I can, uh, I've copy pasted the link to, to that uh, specific page if you would like to scroll through the uh, talk as we move along. Um, okay, so uh, uh, the first section is, is an introduction to the, to the broader uh, area. Uh, it will be very brief and it will not be much useful in, in the later part of the talk, but I thought it would be nice to have um, uh, the context uh, inside which this uh, topic evolves. Um, so one of the active areas of research in categorical algebra is the study of uh, various properties of categories expressed using limits and colimits. Such properties are usually referred to as exactness properties. This terminology comes from the fact that historically the first such properties emerged in the study of exact sequences in the sense of homological algebra. The matrix properties in the title of this talk are particular types of exactness properties which can be encoded using integer matrices. But before explaining what they are, we will uh, first recall the notions of limit and colimit uh, in case uh, someone in the audience has not seen these notions before. Um, so, uh, if we are given a, a diagram of objects and arrows, and these objects uh, can be mathematical structures, and the arrows can be uh, structure preserving maps. So let's consider a simple diagram like this, for instance. Um, the limit is, um, uh, the limit of, a such, a, of such a diagram is uh, an object together with um, arrows going into all the objects of the diagram. And um, there are some conditions this red cone should satisfy. The same red cone also appears in this rotating picture here. Um, one condition is that um, all the triangles that arise here, like for example, this one uh, should be commutative. And that means that uh, composing this map with that map should, should give us this one and similarly here. And that should um, happen for every triangle. Um, now, another feature that the limit needs to have is that if there is another uh, object with a similar cone over the initial diagram, so the, the orange one I'm drawing right now, um, again, uh, the, the, condition, the committing conditions on the triangles apply. Then there must be exactly one arrow uh, from that orange object to the, to the red one, such that once more all the triangles that arise here are commutative in the same sense as described before. Uh, so this is the formal definition of, of the limit intuitively the limit uh, encodes the information about the entire diagram in just a single object. It's a very useful notion, um, but before I give some examples, let me mention that there is also notion of a call limit, and that's when uh, the direction of arrows reverse. So if we do exactly the same as before, but uh, with all the arrows being in the, in the other direction, we get the definition of a call limit. Okay. Um, so I've listed some few ex few examples, but there, there are much more than this because this is a very central notion in uh, mathematics. Uh, so, so for example, uh, various complex topological spaces, so topological spaces that are complicated, 
can be presented as colimits of diagrams of simpler topological spaces. Higher dimensional vector spaces are limits of lower dimensional spaces. Cartesian products of mathematical structures are instances of limits, so sets for groups for topological spaces where you put the Tichon of topology on the Cartesian product. Uh, then every set is a colimit of, of singleton sets. Uh, a singleton set itself is a is a limit of the empty uh, diagram. Uh, starting with a unit interval, combining limits and colimits, we can build spaces such as the sphere, the torus, the Klein bottle, and so on. The monoid of words decomposes as a colimit of multiple copies of the additive monoid of natural Some, numbers. Someone is speaking and it's interfering with the talk. Maybe microphone needs to be muted, just making this comment. Please keep microphones muted if you don't have questions and comments. Sorry about that. Ah, I, I think it's, I see Professor Fedri Nasari joined. Kamar Jawad Batano Fedri. Kamar Jawad. Kamar Jawad Batano Fedri. Kamar Jawad. Chen Chen Fedri, Kamar Jawad. Chen Chen, we don't see you. Oh, are we still here? Can you see what's uh, happening on the screen? Uh, Zurab's slides, is, are they visible on your screen? Yes, man. So maybe Zurab can... I can zoom up, you can go on. Uh, so taking quotient of mathematical structure, for instance, of a set by an equivalence relation or of a group by a normal group is also an example of a colimit. Intersection of uh, subspaces of a set and inverse image of a subset along a function are examples of limits. Profinite structures, for instance, profinite groups are special types of limits of finite structures. Addition and multiplication of natural numbers are examples of colimits and limits. So, so addition is example of colimit and multiplication is example of limit. So you see that there are diverse examples and they really arise every time you, you start looking at certain types of mathematical structures, including the, the natural numbers. These limits and colimits uh, arise there and, and they are important constructions in, in the respective area of, of mathematics. Um, so this is this was just for for anyone who who might not have seen uh, limits and colimits before. I should also mention that uh, they are also known under the name of uh, direct and inverse limits in, in in many textbooks and literature in, in general. Um, now each of these examples requires a suitable category um, in which it is specified what the objects are and what morphisms are between objects. You see that this notion is very abstract. But it relies on, on, on knowing what the, the, the objects, the points represent and what the arrows or the morphisms represent. And we also need to, how to, need to know how to compose them because of the commutativity conditions on the triangles that requires composition of arrows. Um, so just two further remarks about limits and colimits. For a given diagram, its limit as well as colimit when the letter exists is unique, but only up to isomorphism. And also every limit is a colimit in the dual category. So you take a category, you reverse all the arrows in it, you get another category. And limit in the other category is a colimit in the original one and vice versa. So in fact, limit is itself an, an example of, of a colimit and, and vice versa. Uh, a few philosophical remarks to, to conclude the introduction. Uh, so from a concrete perspective, which looks at mathematical structures through the lenses of their elements, uh, so usually when we work with structures, we want, to, we want to do something with the elements of the structure, right? Uh, limits and colimits are tools for constructing uh, local objects in a given universe of mathematical structures. A lot of mathematical constru constructions are very complex to describe, uh, said theoretically, but you can then present them as suitable limits and colimits, which gives you an easier description of these constructions. And in fact, in, in some sense, it's more useful to think of, of these constructions through, through their definition in terms of limits and, and, and colimits. 
But uh, so basically from the co concrete perspective, we can think of limits and colimits as being tools for constructing things. But from an abstract perspective, limits and colimits are tools for analyzing global properties of universes of structures, in, in other words, of categories of structures. Uh, so um, uh, when you no longer have access to the individual elements of your mathematical structures, when you want to zoom out and, and look at the category of structures, uh, which essentially is the structure of composition of, of arrows in the category, then there the, the limit and the columns become the language with which you can express the properties of this entire realm of mathematical structures. And here I want to point out a striking analogy. In real life, addition and multiplication of natural numbers are means for accumulating quantity, but in number theory, they are means for studying the natural number system. But this is not just an analogy, as additional multiplication of natural numbers are instances of columns and limits, respectively, in the category where objects are natural numbers, and a morphism from one number to another is a function from, from a set with corresponding numbers of elements. Let me uh, draw a diagram to illustrate this point. So uh, one of the uh, um, examples of the notion of a limit is the notion of a product. So if we take two natural numbers, uh, A and B, then their product ends up being the usual multiplication of numbers. And now this uh, universal property with cones and co-cones. So this would obviously be the projection maps. So if I think of A as, as a set with A elements and B as a set with B elements, then this will be the Cartesian product of those sets. And these maps will be the projection maps, pi one and pi two. And now the condition says that if I have any other number and two functions from, from the corresponding uh, sets, there and there, there must be a unique function here, making these triangles commutative. But this means, as a consequence of this, we get that the number of, the amount of functions between C and A cross B will be the same as the amount of functions from C to A multiplied by the amount of functions from C to B. Because uh, every pair determines such thing and, and, and this thing is uniquely determined by the pair. Um, so now if I just uh, forget about all the arrows and just write down uh, this property in terms of the, the cardinalities of those sets, what I get is that, of course, the number of functions from C to A uh, will be A to the power C, that multiplied by um, uh, B to the power C, um, and uh, that equals A times B to the power C. So this definition of a limit of a product in this case gives a very familiar law in, uh, that holds for, for natural numbers. It's, a, it's an interesting way of deriving um, some properties of numbers from properties of uh, from definitions of limit and column. The dual situation when we consider columns, so when the arrows reverse here, uh, we'll have um, the sum instead of um, the product. And then uh, this definition of the colimit, which now says that for every other diagram that goes out like this, there must be a unique thing here, uh, will become the property that c to the power a times c to the power b equals c to the power eight plus b. So we actually, in, in some sense, we've seen these definitions, well, at least their numerical counter, uh, numerical projections, so to say, in, in elementary, uh, uh, Property, among elementary properties of, of how uh, multiplication, exponentiation, and addition work in, in the natural number system. Okay, so um, uh, picking, up, uh, picking up on this analogy, um, as much as the uh, study of natural number system employs analysis of properties of multiplication and addition, the study of a category employs analysis of properties of limits and columns. So in some sense, we can think of uh, doing categorical algebra in a general category is some kind of generalization of number theory, where instead of numbers, we now have some abstract structures. And instead of addition and, and multiplication, we want to, to look at columns and limits, which are more general notions than those. Um, so it turns out that properties which involve limits or columns only are much easier to study than properties which involve both limits and columns. This is in fact true in number theory as well, where purely from additive point of view, the natural number system is nothing other than the monoid of words of a singleton, uh, of singleton alphabet. In other words, it is the free monoid over a singleton, 
And from the multiplicative point of view, it is a free commutative monoid over a countable set, namely a set of prime numbers via prime number decomposition. So in elementary number theory, you don't really have theorems that complex theorems or problems that deal only with addition or only with multiplication. All the difficult and uh, uh, very difficult, right? And, and interesting problems of number theory deal, well, elementary number theory at least, deal with the situations where you want to study interaction between addition and multiplication. And this is precisely kind of the thing that's happening in categorical algebra where the complexity comes in where we want to study interaction between limits and columns. But in category theory, because we're not studying just one category, unlike in number theory, even properties which are expressed only in terms of limits or only in terms of columns, even they can sometimes be uh, provide some complexity. And that has to do uh, with the fact that we might be interested in properties that are not true in every category, but only some of them. And then we want to compare them when one property implies another. Okay. So this is the end of the first part of the talk, which was supposed to lay the context of, of the rest of the talk. So what we'll do in the rest of the talk is to, to look at a very specific type of exactness properties that, that will be properties that can be expressed using limits. Uh, but I'm not going to discuss how they can be expressed using limits. I'm just telling you the kind of the background story that this is where this topic comes from. But what we will do later on is to encode these properties in such a way that we can talk about them without knowing anything about category theory. Okay, so I, I want to move to the next part of the talk, but maybe if there are some uh, short questions, I could, uh, I could answer them if, if anyone would like to ask anything about the first part. So if not, then let me move to the second part. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, uh, is my voice um, loud enough? It's perfect. Thank you. On my computer, at least. Um, all right. So in, in the next uh, few um, moments, we'll be doing a bit of very, very elementary geometry. Consider an n-dimensional cube and mark some vertices with the blue marker and mark one of them with red. Let's actually do this while uh, we talk about it. So I've prepared some drawings of um, higher dimensional cubes. Let me take this four dimensional one. Okay, uh, there we go. Sorry, I'm finding the buttons on my keyboard to uh, paste something. Maybe I should try a different way. Um, copy. There we go. So let's take a, a four dimensional cube, for instance. And what we want to do is to color some of the vertices with blue. And uh, we want to choose one uh, other vertex and color it with red. Now, after this, consider a property of a mathematical structure, let's say X, which states that for every representation of the cube in the nth power of X, and we will explain what I mean by representation of a cube in the power of X, and for every substructure S of the nth power of X, if the blue vertices fall in S, then they must also uh, contain, then S must also contain the red vertex. So uh, let, let's embed this cube in, in the usual four dimensional vector space, um, R to the four, uh, by assigning coordinates to the points, right? So we could, for example, the coordinates, so we could choose this for instance to be the origin. So this would be, uh, but I'm, I'm going to deliberately write these coordinates as column vectors. So this will be zero, 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 zero. And for example, this could be one, zero, 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 and so on. Um, so once we assign these, uh, these coordinates, uh, the cube becomes part of uh, R to the four. And now let's consider a condition uh, saying that what, no matter what subspace I take of R to the four, if that subspace contains the blue points, 
then it must contain the, the red point. Uh, now, in this example, it will trivially be the case because the red point is the origin. So, of course, it contains the, of course, every, every subspace of R to the four will contain the red point. So, to make it less trivial, we might want to move away the red point to some other location or reassign the coordinates. So, this didn't have to be one, uh, zero, 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 zero. It could have also been one, 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 one. And this could have been then um, zero, one, 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 and so on. And then, uh, I mean, the geometry of R to the four is, is good, familiar enough. We, we can find the origin and then and see what, what space these three vectors will span. Uh, and, and this way we can see if the, if the red vega point will be there or not. But this can be done not just for R to the four. We can do this embedding of, of an n-dimensional cube for any mathematical structure raised to the power four where uh, in, for the coordinates, we will just have to choose uh, the, the values for zero and one. So one could be some element X and zero could be another element Y. And now we want to um, ask the following question. Is it true that no matter how I embed the cube into X to the four and no matter what subspace S I will take of x to the four, and, and subspace in this case means a substructure. So it's a subset that will be closed under all the operations. If it's an algebraic structure, if it's a topological structure, it will be a subset with induced topology. So whatever the notion of, of substructure I have in that, in that category of structures. Uh, so for every S, uh, whenever the blue points are in S, the red one must also be there. So we Sorry, get a sort of geometry. I, can I ask a quick question? So maybe yes. I missed something. So uh, are you talking about some particular distribution of the colors or just any distribution? So what were the... So we fix a distribution of colors and yes. each distribution of colors gives rise to a condition. And we can remember the distribution of colors as a kind of geometric shape. I mean, the, the cube together with the colored uh, vertices. So the cube with the colored vertices is one condition. If, if I change the coloring, this will be a different condition. So, so you can have several red points also? Well, we could, but we, if I have several red points, this is equivalent to, to have a conjunction of those different uh, cubes with single, so as, as a logical property. So we only consider one red point because the, the, the others are conjunctions, but we could also have several. Okay. Uh, so so we, we get a condition that we can ask for any mathematical structure, and it, it, it could actually be quite interesting to investigate and classify for each type of structure what, uh, which of these cubes uh, uh, fail and which of these cubes hold there. Now, what does this have to do with exactness properties? So this property that, that I explained about a general mathematical structure can also be formulated as a property of a category if we ask this property to hold for every object X in the category. So previously, X could have been, let's say, a group or a ring or a vector space or a topological space. But now each of these mathematical structures have a natural surrounding category in which they live. For example, the category of groups. And we could ask, is it true that in the category of groups, every object X has this property? In other words, is it true that this, this condition holds for every single group? So when we ask this for every structure of a given type, we get a condition on a category. And it turns out to be a condition that can be expressed in any category. But if we want some very basic properties to hold, we want this category to have limits, uh, specifically finite limits. Um, okay, so that's how we get an exact, so this will be an example of exactness property. And the, the talk is dedicated to exactness properties that are expressible using such uh, n-dimensional cubes, uh, colored cubes. And I will present some results uh, uh, obtained about these properties in, in, in what follows. Let me remark before going into that, let me remark that such property can be represented using a matrix of zeros and ones. That's already evident from um, the coordinate representation of the points on the cube. So the way this works is that we take each colored, each, uh, uh, each vertex that's colored blue, and we write out its coordinates in a column. So 
here we have uh, this column labeled C. And on the diagram, oops, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, now we can't see anymore, but on the diagram C is here. And in this diagram specifically, this is the origin. So, um, so C has coordinate, uh, so, so it lies on one of the axes. So it has coordinate zero, 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 one and so on. So every blue point becomes, um, uh, becomes a column of, um, of a matrix. So that's how we, we build the matrix. We put the coordinates of, uh, of the blue point, just like in, in linear algebra in some sense, right? Um, then there is a hidden column, which is the coordinates of the red point. In this case, it will be zero, zero, zero. And when, when this uh, red point has coordinate zero, 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 then we simply omit it and we can just keep the, uh, keep the, the, the coordinates of the blue matrix because we, we remember that the uh, red one always has coordinates, all, all coordinates zero. And so this geometric condition becomes re represented as, as a matrix. Um, okay, so I say here a few words about representing this cube in the nth power of, of a structure X. So this amounts to choosing elements of X that will be called zero and one, just like we did here on the blackboard where we called zero and one to be X and Y. But remember for any choice of these names, the, the condition should hold. Um, and but uh, you only choose two paint, points at a time, right? The two elements. Uh, so because it's it's a, it's a cube, red. yeah. Because it's a cube, we will only have to choose two. Two. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. I think so. The question is that they, they, when you say they choose arbitrary elements from the structure, you mean the pair of elements at a time? So that's yes. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah, a, a pair of elements x and y. So I, I need to interpret this matrix. So I need to uh, write in, instead of zeros and ones, I need to write elements of, of my structure. So zeros will be Xs and one, ones, will be, ones will be ones, Ys. So I need to specify a pair uh, of, of consisting of X and Y, which corresponds to zero and one. Um, so some examples. So this specific uh, diagram we have here um, is actually something that, that holds in quite a big variety of, of structures. And there are two examples. Uh, one is uh, in the category of groups where we could express A as C minus F plus D. So if I look at um, uh, C, um, F, and D, if I look at these three columns, uh, if I take their linear combination C minus F plus D, so no matter what zeros and ones are, they could have been X's and Y's as well. If I subtract F from C and then add D to it, you will see that we will get a column of zeros. So let's check. So uh, in the first two rows, it's obvious. In the third one, we have zero minus one plus one, and that's of course zero. And the last one we have one minus one plus zero, and that's of course zero as well. In other words, if I dependencies between the vertices are translated to actual equalities in the structure, right? If I dependencies yes. you're using, okay. Yes, yes, because we, we want every substructure of X to the four to contain the column of zeros as soon as, as soon as it contains these other columns. That means that that column of zeros will be expressed as a combination of the other columns using the operations we have available in that structure. If it's a, if it's a, if it's an algebraic structure. And so we found this combination to express A in terms of the other columns. We don't need here the, the columns B, H, I, and P. We only need C, F, D. But for a different structure like a lattice, we might need other columns. And here's another example where uh, when X is a lattice in the sense of lattice theory, so it's a partially ordered set having uh, binaries, um, finite suprema and infima. We can also think of it as a special kind of a category having uh, finite limits and columns. Um, then we can express A as C meet D joined with D meet B joined with B meet C. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into detail why this is so, but one can easily check that. So let me just check, let's say one line of this. So if I take uh, C, D and B, so, so this would be columns that I'm going to mark now uh, with, uh, so this is C, D, and B. 
So let's say we take, uh, we want to check for, for the last coordinate. So I need to consider one meet um, uh, zero, join one um, meet zero again, join zero meet zero. Um, so this simplifies to, so this is supreme and infima among two, two elements. So, so this simplifies to uh, one meet zero, join zero. Um, and of course, one meet zero is less than zero. So if you join with zero, you get zero. Um, so both the category of groups and uh, the category of lattices has this matrix property that's given by um, the previous picture. Okay. So by this picture. Um, so this the same property turns out to hold in, in the dual category of the category of sets. So in, when we switch to the dual category of sets, we, we no longer necessarily have operations, right? Um, as well as the dual of the category of topological spaces and many other categories. So this is actually quite a weak property. It, it actually holds in, in quite a lot of, of categories, not only algebraic, but also duals of geometric structures. Um, and, and in this figure, in this condition we have here, if we delete the points B, H, I, and P, we will obtain a matrix property that defines so-called multi of categories, among which are many categories of group-like structures, as well as the dual of any topos. Uh, topos is a generalization of the category of sets. It's a category in which you can do mathematics just like you can do mathematics inside the, the set theory. On the other hand, if we delete the points F, H, I, and P, then we will obtain a matrix property that defines so-called majority categories. Majority categories play a similar role for lattice-like structures as multi categories do for group-like structures. Many theorems for groups and other similar structures can be proved uh, in multi categories. Similarly, many theorems for lattice-like structures can be proved in majority categories. And a pioneer of this is uh, Dr. Michael Hufnachel, who is attending this talk. Thanks, Michael, for being here. Uh, the dual of the category of topological spaces happens to be majority category as well, uh, but not a multi category. Um, okay, so um, let's move on. Uh, uh, the matrix property defining multi categories implies the property given by the matrix above. So it's just because we deleted some columns. Um, and intuitively it should be clear. So if, if we have flu fewer blue vertices that guarantee the, the presence of the red vertex inside the subspace, then of course, uh, having more blue vertices would, would still guarantee the presence of the red one. However, in general implications of matrix properties are not given merely by addition of uh, or, or removal of, of columns. Uh, these, moreover, these implications are also context sensitive. So it depends for which classes of categories do we want the implication to hold. So Im imagine we have two different cubi cubical pictures and we want to say every time a category satisfies one, it needs to satisfy the other. Now, what kind of category? Only algebraic categories or all categories or categories having limits? So depending on, on the context, um, the answer to the question whether one matrix property implies the other can be different. Um, in the context of algebraic, algebraic categories, matrix properties become a special type of linear multi conditions studied in universal algebra. And we actually do not know yet an algorithm for deciding implication of linear multi conditions. But very recently, we found an algorithm for deciding implications of matrix properties in the context of categories having finite limits. This context is the context for definitions of multi of category, majority category, as well as many others that have been studied in categorical algebra since 1990s, sorry. And hence it's a natural habitat for matrix properties. So in category theory, uh, if we really want to do lots of complicated stuff, you, you actually want both limits and colimits to be there. But um, many things still can be done just using the limits. And even though uh, such things, uh, kind of reduced to doing these things just for sets, 
there can be some complex uh, theorems that you can prove just using limits. And, and, and some results in categorical algebra indeed are, are only um, are investigated that very general level of categories having just, just limits. Uh, and uh, among them is this notion of multi category and majority category. And so this uh, study of implications of matrix properties for categories having finite limits is, is a reasonable thing to do. And then this, so the algorithm we found, it then settles a problem that has been open, uh, a problem, uh, I mean, it's not widely open. It was something that I wondered and I never find, found a solution um, uh, since the, the matrix properties were first defined in my master thesis in 2004. So that's the end of the second part of my talk. Now, looking at the time, I will probably not have uh, time for the third part. Um, but the third part is not much. Anyway. You still have, I mean, enough time to talk something substantial, I guess. It's still. Yes. So the, I hope to I hope to talk uh, properly about the third part in the in the next ten minutes. But but maybe if the, there is a couple of questions, I could answer that first about the second part. Um, so if not, then I'll continue. Okay, so this algorithm for deciding implications of matrix properties is a geometric description. And that's something that I, um, I mean, I was, I always had this geometric thing in my mind, but I never took it seriously. And I guess for preparing for, uh, for, it, of a, talk, for a talk, for, uh, preparing a talk for the seminar, because the seminar very explicitly mentions geometry in the title, I thought, let me actually look into that geometric interpretation. Maybe something interesting comes out of that. And indeed, I was very happy to see that uh, this algorithm for deciding implications of matrix properties has a very simple and elegant geometric description. Uh, so if we have two matrices, um, okay, but before we arrive to that description, we need to introduce a few notions. So let's consider two matrices. matrices. When I say a matrix, I mean this n-dimensional cube with colored blue and red uh, vertices. Um, okay. so. First, we need to explain the notion of when one matrix is a reduction of another one. So if we have matrix M and matrix L, we will say that L uh, is a reduction of M when L can be obtained from M by a succession of following transformations. And here are the transformations illustrated um, in these um, images. Expansion. So you have your colored cube, and you're simply adding a dimension to it. And it doesn't matter in which direction you're adding the dimension. So the orientation of your axis doesn't matter. In fact, all of this story is invariant under the choice of axis. Um, so we, we can really concentrate on, on the cubes and don't, don't worry about the coordinates. Uh, so that's one transformation. Uh, so when, when you have uh, um, a, a colored cube and you're simply adding a dimension to it, but you're not coloring anything uh, in the added uh, part. The second transformation is collapse. That's basically projection. You, you pick one dimension and you project along that and you, you squash it into the lower dimension and you delete whatever you uh, projected, but you, you keep the, uh, the colors. So the colors gets projected and they're kept. So you see here, um, this, for example, this top blue vertex uh, colors this vertex blue uh, after projection. Uh, the third transformation is tilt. Now, this is very interesting. So this is when you have, so you, you pick a certain direct, uh, dimension. So in this case, we have this four-dimensional cube and we have these two three-dimensional hypercubes. So the, the fourth dimension that I'm looking at right now in this picture goes horizontally. And so you pick uh, a dimension uh, and then you make sure that uh, in, in the, on the right side, you had no, no colorings at all. It was completely empty. So you could get this, for example, by, by expansion. And then what you do is that you pick another dimension, which is now um, the vertical dimension. And you, you split your cube in two parts. And in the second part of the vertical dimension, you slide all the colorings in the other side. But you, you keep the, the top part here. Uh, so it's like tilting the, the, the shape. So that's the third transformation. And the fourth one is inside out turn. So that's when you select a dimension and you swap the coordinates of the points just in that dimension. 
So geometrically, this means that the, the so once again, if, if the dimension we fixed is the horizontal one, then uh, all the colorings on the, on the left hypercube move to the right and all the current colorings of the right hypercube move to the left. So these are the four basic uh, operations that we can perform on these uh, matrices. And uh, we call a matrix L a reduction of M if L can be obtained from M by a sequence of these transformations. Now, uh, what about the condition? So, um, I, I mean, what about the characterization of implication? So uh, if the structure of blue vertices of a reduction L of M can be embedded in N, then we can add to N a blue vertex at the relative position of the red vertex in L. So let me explain this on the picture. So uh, imagine we have, um, So we now have two cubes. One is uh, uh, corresponds to some matrix M and the other one corresponds to matrix N. And we, we try to decide whether M implies N or not. And so N has its own requirement that for example, um, these existence of these three should guarantee existence of this in the substructure in subspace. And let's say M says that, um, um, M says this, uh, and maybe M says uh, something um, slightly different. Maybe M says this. Okay, so um, at this point, we can see that M does not match into N at all. But after applying some transformation to M, namely, namely the tilt. I could uh, uh, I could move. Um, can I actually? Uh, no, not the tilt. Sorry, the projection. If I apply projection, I could move these two top blue points uh, down here, right? And then after that, so this is one transformation of L, L M that I created. So let's call it L. Now, after this, this part, uh, remember with the projection, the top part will, will disappear. This part matches with, with that, the, the blue parts match. And because the blue parts match, I can add a red point borrowed from L. Now this red point that I added to N becomes the blue point, a new blue point of N. And I can repeat this process, generating reductions of M that can geometrically match into some fragment of N and as a result produce a new blue point inside M. And so another matching I could try to do here would be, um, actually I would be quite stuck here, right? I can't do anything else. But if my original N contained another point, sorry about that, maybe this one. So let's pretend this one also was there. Then I could match further, I could match the same thing actually further to then, to then arrive to the point of destination. So, if, so basically what happens is that I'm considering various different reductions of M and then I'm trying to match each reduction to N to produce a new point inside N. And by, as N gets more and more points, eventually I want to capture the, the red point um, of N. And if that happens, then M will imply N. So every category satisfying the matrix property M will have the matrix property N. And also the converse is true. If, if in every category M implies N, then I will be able to demonstrate this using the geometric uh, steps that I showed. So uh, it's a quite, uh, uh, I mean, for, for me personally, who, who was working with these matrix properties since my master's, it was, one of the illuminating uh, results uh, because it was possible to get this uh, classification of implication of matrix properties using very, very elementary terms. Okay, um, at this stage, I'm going to skip some, some of this uh, and move to some pictures, some further pictures. 
So as you see, this algorithm is such that we can uh, teach a computer how to figure out implications of matrix properties. And the computer can generate for us these uh, directed graphs. Um, and I'm very much hoping uh, of some consultation from Tamara, who is an expert of gra graph network visualization to suggest what would be the best tool for visualizing these uh, post sets of matrix properties because they can get very, very big. Um, so this is just the three dimensional case, but as soon as we move to the four dimensional case, it becomes bigger. And this is not the entire four dimensional case. It's actually even bigger, um, which I'm going to uh, show you now from, from a different uh, talk. So this is the, still not the full four dimensional uh, picture. Uh, and the, the full one is, is very big and the five dimensional we can't produce because it's too, like, too, too long for a computer, but it, it would be very nice if we can have a, a tool for visualizing the full four dimensional case, which is much, much bigger than this one. It has 422 uh, nodes, uh, that, that network graph. Okay, so I think I'm, I ran out of my time. So I'm going to, um, end off with just a couple of remarks, if I may still, uh, oh, is sure. it okay, okay? One or two minutes. Yeah, so uh, just want to add, so, so I didn't manage to go to, till the end of what I wrote up, but if you are interested, you can have a look at it uh, from the link that I posted on, in chat. Um, so it's on my website. Uh, we use this geometric uh, description, not only for the computer to generate new results, but uh, I mean, not only for the computer to generate some results, but also for, uh, for us to prove uh, some theorems. And, and some fascinating theorems include, for instance, the fact that um, every matrix property will be either implied by the majority matrix, so that's the one that corresponds to lattices, or implies the multi property, but not both. So it's a, it's a very curious fact, which Nobody has ever conjectured anything like that. It, it just came out as a consequence of analyzing the algorithm. Um, and then the, the, this uh, post on my website ends with some references. Um, and I think um, that's really where I should stop. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a beautiful, beautifully arranged uh, and animated presentation. Thank you so much. So okay. I stop recording at this point, so we can move to the questions and answers. Just...